Hello, welcome Dr. Stephanie Taylor. Thank you so much for being here and doing Gen, Gen Chem study session for another year. Um, feel free and take it away. All right, um, so since this is the first one of the semester, how these reviews work in general, and I know this question will come up again, so that's okay, um, is one, um, we are rec we're recording, right, right, Ryan? I assume we are. Yes, we will. Be this is being recorded. <laughs> OK, I was like, <laughs> I meant to confirm that. I just assumed we were. Um, so we are recording this. Uh, this will go up later um, on some sort of streaming service. The link will be available uh, since it's going to be a two hour long video. That does take a little bit of time, so it will not be available instantly. But as soon as that is available, it will get sent out through all the means that we have. So Living Learning Community will send it out. Uh, I will send it out through the exam section, the 701 section, uh, which we'll talk more about in a moment. Um, there is also a chat available. The way that that works uh, is we have a fabulous moderator who will pass the questions on to me. Um, I am hanging out on a single screen because I am at home. Uh, and so what you see is what I see. <laughs> so I don't actually see the chat right now. Uh, but there's a moderator who will be helping me out. Um, and if we run out of time, that moderator will actually pass me some of the questions if I run out of time and don't answer them. Um, so we'll get to as many things as possible. Um, I have up here some of the commonly asked questions. Um, before I get to that, uh, first of all, one of the things you're going to hear me reference is the 701 section. So let me show you where that is first. So in e-learning, Da, da, da. Um, your e-learning will look a little bit different than mine, but you've got some various courses. And one of the things you have access to, which you probably haven't used a whole lot, is the Chem 1311.701. Um, so this is something that all of the Gen Chem students in everybody's section should have access to. If for whatever reason you do not have access to it, let us know. Should be able to fix it. But uh, the dot 701 section just has things that we tend to send out to everybody and is often where we'll make announcements for exam stuff. So it does have things like online office hours. There's an exam reviews folder. I went ahead and threw up there a syllabus, the 2019 exams, end of chapter questions and end of chapter question keys. Everyone should have had access to all of these things from their previous courses, but I understand that when I'm saying, hey, go look at this, and if you are in Dr. Abacone's section, she probably has that in a different folder than I do. Um, so this way, everybody's got access to the 701 section uh, and they're all in the same place in that case. Um, so duplication of resources is never a bad thing. Uh, so a couple of questions that most folks typically have. Uh, so first of all, your exam is on Saturday. Um, it is at 10 a.m. Saturday, September 17th. Uh, so this is coming up. So it is in six days. Okay, how you want to count that. Uh, it is on campus. It is in person. Uh, it is on paper. Um, so, so this is a paper exam. This will be mostly Scantron. So it will be mostly multiple choice um, with two short answers. Um, so right now, um, so when I say right now, I mean today is Sunday, September 11th, and it is 4.05 p.m. Uh, when I last checked my email at about 2 p.m., um, there were 28 uh, multiple choice questions and two short answer. Um, that does not mean that that's how many there will be on Saturday because we have not printed the exam yet. Um, so it is still going through final, final edits, uh, but all five instructors have had a chance to look at all of the questions. So right now, there's 28 multiple choice questions and two short answer. Uh, again, that might change, but it should be close to that. Um, so we are in final edit mode, um, but that's, that's what we have right now. And I understand that some of you do not like the fact that I am vague, but as this review is on Sunday and the exam gets printed on either Monday or Tuesday, there's a little bit of wiggle room. So that's what I know right now. 
So how many questions are on the exam, the format of the exam. Oh, the other thing I wanted to say about format, um, because there it is multiple choice, you are always going to select just one answer. So you will have five answer choices, A, B, C, D, and E, and you will always pick the best single answer um, out of those answer choices. Uh, the other thing with this is we provide the Scantron for this. We provide the Scantron. So I know some people will be concerned about what kind you need to buy. For Scantrons, the answer is nothing. Um, but there are things you need to bring to the exam. Um, I have something ah, down here. Um, I didn't think through this organization very well. Uh, what do you need to bring to the exam? You need to bring pencils. I do recommend more than one. We have extras, um, but pencils are always good. A photo ID. Your comment card works great for this, um, but anything that has your name and your picture on it works fine. Um, so pencils, a photo ID, and your calculator, which needs to be a TI-30, XA or a TI-30X2S or a TI-30X2B. Um, those are the three calculators that are allowed in your syllabus. Those are the only three calculators we will allow you to use on your exam. If you come with something that is not one of these, we will ask you to put it away and take the exam without a calculator. So you need to have one of these types of calculators. They're in the syllabus. We talked about it on the first day of class. Everybody has brought it up more times than that. Uh, and I know people in the chat right now are feverishly typing, what about this one? If it's not one of these, the answer is no. So you're always welcome to ask. You're welcome to ask me any question you want about the calculator, but I'm telling you right now, if it's not one of these three, the answer is no. Other things about the exam. Uh, where? Um, I'll come back to this one in a minute. Uh, where is the exam? It's on campus. Um, we are still working on room assignments. Good news, once we have the room assignments, they will be the same for the entire semester. Uh, so I do apologize that we don't have those out yet, uh, but the good news is once we have those, they will be the same for all of your exams. May have to change for the final, but for the four midterm exams, they'll be the same. Uh, but we'll be in buildings, uh, like we'll be in the science building, we'll be in the science learning center, we'll be in Johnson, we'll be in Green, we'll be in lots of different buildings. Um, so we'll have those assignments out. They're gonna be alphabetized by last name. Uh, those will be out soon. Um, we're going to finish the exam first and then get around to that. Uh, another question, uh, are there more calculation type questions or more conceptual questions? Um, so I asked my classes on Friday for questions and this was one of the ones that came from them. This is a question that I often get asked. It is always a valid question. I also can't answer this question very well. Um, and here's why. Because usually when people talk about this word more, which kind of question are there more of? Um, the real question you are actually trying to ask me is what's gonna take me the longest? Um, is where am I gonna spend my time? Um, because at, at one point I actually tried to answer this question and the hard thing is, is, is that I then had students telling me that I lied to them because there is, if you actually count out of the 28 plus the two short answer questions, so the 30 questions total, how many of them required a calculation, there's that number. And then there's the idea that out of the 80 minutes that you have total, how much of that time did those calculation questions take you? And those two things are not always the same because some people will be faster at calculation questions. Some people will be faster at conceptual questions. And so there's a lot of psychology that goes into how many questions are there 
and how many of each type. And frankly, every time I've ever given an actual answer, people come up to me later and tell me that I lied. And then I take their exam and I count them for them. And then they just get mad at me. <laughs> so <laughs> this is always a valid question. Um, I always struggle to answer it well. Um, so oftentimes I don't. So highly recommend you ask other instructors and see what they tell you. Uh, but that's my answer for that question. Um, oh, when should I show up for the exam? Um, so your exam, so when, when I say your exam is at 10 a.m., uh, this is 10 a.m. is when we start to pass out the exam. Uh, that's what 10 a.m. is. 10 a.m. is when we start to pass out scantrons. We start to pass things out. Uh, we start to tell you to put all your books away. We start giving instructions at 10 a.m. Uh, so when should I show up to the exam? I would really actually recommend 9.30. Um, I know that that seems like, oh no, it's even earlier, but 9.30, if you aim for 9.30, that gives you time to make sure you find the building, you find the room, you find a seat, um, and, and you are in place, ready to go, and can just relax, have time to go to the bathroom again, all of that jazz without a problem. Um, the other thing you should know uh, is since we are back to in-person exams, uh, what's going to happen is since your exam is on paper, um, that paper, um, you actually keep it. So we are going to keep the Scantron. So the Scantron uh, is the thing that you turn in, which means that as soon as the first person leaves the exam, the exam is officially leaked. It is officially out, and we will not let latecomers take the exam. Uh, so if you are late, as in someone else has already completed the exam and turned it in, we will not let you begin the exam. We will turn you away uh, and have you take a zero on the first exam and have the final exam replace it. I understand that nobody likes that, but social media and the ability to commute, communicate instantaneously is a real thing. Uh, and so we want everybody to be on an equal playing field as much as we possibly can. Therefore, once the first person leaves the exam, no new people get to start it. So, and that oftentimes is about 1020 or 1030 in the morning. Uh, but I don't actually know. It could be earlier than that. So you need to be to the exam on time and early. So go ahead. I would recommend aim for 930 because 10 a.m. is when we start to pass things out. Any questions so far? Hi, right, so we have um, a few questions in the public chat. The uh, mm -hmm. first one here is a quick question. Say, for example, we did badly on the first test. Will final replace the grade? OK, so this idea about the final replacing, um, I need to make sure that this is clear because the policy is final exam replaces lowest exam. That's our policy. Now, here's the thing, though. This is designed to account for car accidents. So if you are in a car accident in the, on the morning of the exam and you cannot make it to the exam, that's what this policy is there for. Um, if you have something where um, you are, um, uh, your roommate's in the hospital. Uh, gosh, I hope this doesn't happen. These are all, these are always bad things. Um, let's say your roommate's in the hospital and you are by their bedside all night uh, and therefore you oversleep because you are a good roommate and you take care of them in the hospital and you oversleep. Uh, your final exam replaces your lowest exam. Um, let's say that there is a concert um, that your like best friend from high school invites you to, and man, that is a like fantastic event to be at, and you would rather be there than on our exam. Your final exam replaces your lowest exam score. Um, so yes, it is also true that whatever this lowest exam score, your final will replace it as long as it's higher, I should say. Um, so all of these things 
would result in an exam score of zero. Um, and so that's why we say that final exam replaces the lowest. Um, we do also, um, so if, if you actually manage to make it to all four exams, which we certainly hope that you do, we would certainly like you to do that. Um, so if you actually have scores for all four exams, if the final is higher, then the final will also replace, will replace your lowest exam score no matter what it is, um, as long as the final exam is higher. Um, so if final is higher, final exam replaces the one lowest exam score. Um, so whether that is a zero because something tragic happened or it's a zero because you decided you need to be somewhere else or if that is just a low number because things happened, um, then your final exam replaces as long as the final exam is higher. Um, I'll be saying this again, I'm certain, but essentially what we do at the end of the semester is we always calculate your grades twice, once with all four midterm exams and once with the final replacing, and we just take the higher number. So we essentially just run the calculation two ways and whatever gives you a higher grade, we assume that that's what you would want, and we do that. Uh, so the nice thing is, is that you don't have to like opt in to this policy. We just have two different ways to calculate your final grades, and we automatically give you the higher version, no matter what. Additional questions? I think you said there's more than one. Yeah, there's a few of these. Uh, <laughs> next one is, what does short answers mean on the test? What are your answers mean on the test? Um, so we are currently working on the exact language, um, but short answer means that on your Scantron, uh, on the back of your Scantron, um, there is a, it's roughly eight and a half by 11 and there's a whole bunch of lines on the back. Um, and short answer means that you have to write stuff down from scratch. Um, as far as short answer goes, uh, so I was so this is what I was telling some of my students. Um, so things that work well for a short answer, because keep in mind, um, there are roughly 1400 of you. Um, so we have to grade these things and we have to grade them in a way that is the same across everybody. Um, so things that work well for short answer um, are things like calculations. Calculation questions work really well um, because while there are a lot of varieties of ways you can problem solve, there are only so many ways you can problem solve uh, and you are going to be showing us work. So calculations work great for this. Uh, the other thing that works well for this, um, for this exam coming up, um, I would say uh, quantum numbers could also work pretty well for a short answer question. I would also say um, the orbital notation could work pretty well for a short answer question. And so could, um, what's that other thing called? Uh, electron configuration. Um, for those of you who are curious, uh, quantum numbers are in chapter three. Uh, orbital notation and electron configuration are in chapter four, uh, but are going to be on our exam. Um, so all of these things work pretty well for a short answer because they are things that we can say have an answer to them uh, and are relatively straightforward as far as what the answer should look like. There will still be variations as far as what people might exactly put down, but there's a limit to what that looks like. Um, I understand that depending on what your high school class looked like, uh, you may have had like short answer essays. If you took the AP, any AP science exam, there are always essays on those. Um, kudos to the people that grade those essays. Uh, we are not going to do that. Um, so it's a great question if you were in a study group uh, to ask yourselves why uh, things are the way they are. Um, but why is a really great study question. Uh, to ask each other, um, but this is a terrible short answer question um, because there are so many different ways 
to answer why questions that are valid that in order to grade 1400 of them in a reasonable amount of time uh, is not something that we are up to this semester, I'll say. Um, if that changes, I'll let you know. Um, but essentially, um, when the teaching team decided we were going to be doing some short answer, the teaching team, the five of us, are the ones grading these. Uh, we do not have TAs that are going to be grading these for us. Uh, so all 1,400 of them are going to be graded by five people. Uh, and y'all have probably noticed by now, we busy. Uh, your instructors are busy. Um, so as much as I would really love to ask some why questions, because I've done that in the past and they're really fun, um, short, short answer works a heck of a lot better when there's e easier things to grade. Um, so this is one of those times where um, the fact that they have to be graded by five people is going to be a factor that goes into what sorts of things we ask. Um, so those are all things that work well for short answer questions for this exam at least. Other questions? Uh, the next one is what does the open pie on the Alex calendar mean? Oh, um, so open pie in the Alex calendar. Um, what that means is you are able to work on um, open pie, I should say, open pie. Uh, you can work on any topic you are ready to learn. Um, so this also means uh, you, if you lost things from a knowledge check, um, you can also go back. Um, so open pie will also let you do that. Um, it will also let you go forward. Uh, so whatever in the algorithm you are ready to learn, you can work on during OpenPy. So that's that's what OpenPy is. Some people never realize that we have OpenPy because some people only ever work on Alex during the due dates. So it's entirely possible you've never seen it before. Um, and if that's true, that's also OK, but that's what it is. Um, and so we usually set up sometimes specifically OpenPy um, just so that that way it's on the calendar and you know that you can have that as a feature for Alex. Other things? There are a few more questions, so if you don't want me to move on in a minute, I don't know how many more you want to take. But however, the uh, next question is, where could we find a metric conversion chart? Where can you find the metric conversion chart? Um, the, I believe it's the front matter of your textbook. Um, so metric, so first of all, let me say this. Um, da, 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 da. One of these, uh, what do I need to memorize? Uh, one of the things you need to memorize um, are going to be equations and metric conversions. So metric conversions are things you need to memorize. Uh, as far as where you can find a metric conversions chart, there is the front matter of your textbook. Um, let's see if I can get to it in a small number of clicks. So if I go to, I actually don't want the 701 section because I need something with Alex in it. Da -da 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 -da. Alex, because that's where the ebook is. Oh, look, I was listening to a Mountain Goat song so that I could make sure that my earbuds were plugged in. I was trying to get rid of all of my tabs before I do this. <laughs> I've not checked my earbuds. That's fine. Da -da 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 -da. E book. Da -da -da -da. Come on, Alex. Come on, e book. Um, so I am, I think, just in a uh, table of contents, some useful tables. <laughs> that is where I am. Uh, so it is, if you have a physical version of the textbook, it would be in the very beginning pages. Uh, but some, but this has, there it goes. Uh, some prefixes used with SI units. Uh, so goes Terra, um, 10 to the 12th, down to Pico, 10 to the negative 12th. Um, and so these, front matter of your textbook. Wikipedia also has them, uh, but Wikipedia has a heck of a lot more than we ever use. Uh, this, these, these are the ones that we actually limit ourselves to. Uh, so negative 12 to positive 12 exponent wise. Uh, is what we limit ourselves to. Um, the only other one on here we do not use, and this is mostly just because 
it doesn't come up that often. We don't use deci very often. This one in the bottom left. Um, I haven't seen us use deci in the time I've been teaching. Uh, everything else we do use. Uh, so centi, most people are familiar with centimeters. So centi we use, milli we use, um, micro, nano. Pico doesn't come up terribly often, but we're allowed to use it. Uh, same game, uh, kilo we use a lot. Mega comes up occasionally. Um, Giga and Terra, uh, this is this is one of those odd things where it used to be really common to be familiar with Giga and Terra because of computers. Um, I understand now that everything's just cloud-based and you just assume you have all the space that you possibly need and almost nobody uses flash drives anymore. But these, these are your metric prefixes. I'll stop rambling. These are your metric prefixes. Uh, so fix that. So back to, whoops, not that. Back to this. Oh, other questions. That was metric prefixes. What else? Uh, the chat. Next question is, uh, is there a specific type of pencil we need, like a type two or is anything fine? Uh, so as far as your pencils, like most pencils on the market are a number two pencil. So that that's pretty much what you need. Um, I think you have to go out of your way to find not a number two pencil. The Scantron reader works on the on the shininess of the graphite. Um, so the Scantron reader actually works because of the reflection um, of the graphite on the page. So I would recommend a number two pencil. Um, do not use pen. Um, I understand some schools have fancy Scantron readers. Um, ours is not that fancy. Uh, ours requires the reflection of, of the graphite in order to be read. Um, so you do, you do need pencils. I would recommend a number two. Um, it, those are the most common out there. Uh, and if you don't have a number two pencil, we have extra pencils. Um, so they, they are just regular wooden pencils. Uh, most people are more comfortable with a mechanical pencil. Wooden ones are cheaper. Wooden ones are what we will give you if you ask. Um, so we do have extra ones if you need this. Uh, other things out of the chat. All right, uh, next uh, person says, I was looking at the 2019 exam just to review and I didn't see any short answer questions. Is there a place where we can find practice for short answer? Is there a place you can practice short answer? Absolutely. Um, you can practice short answer questions with the end of chapter questions out of your textbook. Um, so, Another thing I went ahead and put on the course homepage, uh, we have recommended end of chapter questions. These are out of your textbook um, and they are a great resource to practice short answer questions. Um, I understand that people would also like ones that were written by your instructors. Um, if you can find it, us usually somewhere there is a drop box full of old exams. Um, we did short answer exams fall of 2018. Uh, which is the reason why uh, those are hard to find. But if you can find them, um, fall in 2018, we did short answer exams. Um, granted, <laughs> we had a lot of more faith in how many and how well we could grade stuff. Um, and that's part of why I know what we will not be using as short answer because we spent a lot of time on those questions. I'm really sorry, my dog is coughing in the background. Um, so that's my dog. He's fine, by the way. He's fine. Um, aside from the fact that I'm talking to my laptop and he deserves a treat. Um, so I'm giving my dog a treat. Um, other questions out of the chat? Uh, do we just want to touch on the four, but some that, are we given four, are we given four of those on the exam? So as far as what you're given on the exam, uh, in the 2019 exam, um, you can find what we give you, which I'm not actually going to load this because I brought it up in one note, um, what we give you is called a, uh, is a periodic table. Uh, this periodic table is also in the 701 section. Um, this is the periodic table out of your textbook. Yours will be in black and white. So yours will be not in color. Uh, yours will be in black and white, but otherwise it is this periodic table. Um, so all the information it has, you will have, but except for the fact that it will be in black and white. Um, the other thing you're going to have is potentially useful information. 
Um, so potentially useful information as you look at this, um, it has constants on it. Uh, so it has things like Avogadro's number, it has a constant for the Bohr model of the hydrogen atom, it has the speed of light, it has Planck's constant, uh, it's got information about a joule and some other miscellaneous stuff on here. Uh, it has no formulas though, it has no formulas. Uh, and it will not have any formulas. Um, so no formulas. So those are for you to memorize. So you have potentially useful information, so that way you don't have to memorize numbers, but you do have to memorize metric prefixes and you do have to memorize uh, equations. Other questions out of the chat? I believe this one was also touched on earlier, but uh, do you recommend studying the past test or all topics on the past test on this test? Excellent question. Um, so it's been three years since 2019, yeah? um things change <laughs> in, in years um and one of the easiest examples so the material is not all the same um so this is one of the hardest parts about looking at old exams which, which is we do change things from year to year uh so one of the easiest examples is significant figures uh over the summer the entire teaching team met and we decided to not lecture over to not test on significant figures so they might have been mentioned in some of your classes because most of our notes still have significant figures in them or they're being utilized in calculations because that's the way that we've done it for a very long time. But this year, we're not testing on it. So there are probably two questions on the 2019 exams just over sig figs, and you will not find those uh, this year because we are not testing on significant figures. Uh, we decided that that was better left to the lab uh, and to practical applications, and we are not testing on them. So you will not find significant figures on the 22 year exam this year, um, but they were on the 2019 exam because they've been on every exam um, until now, because this year we decided not to do it. Okay. Other things from the chat, or am I back to my list? All right, the, there's, a, there's a few more. <laughs> All right. All right, the, um, the next question is, where will room assignments be posted? Everywhere. <laughs> um, once we have room assignments, uh, we will put them in the 701 section. We'll put them in the announcement section. We'll put them on the course homepage. We will throw them up, up in class, in the beginning of class, at the end of class. They will be everywhere once we have them. Uh, but we don't have them, which is why you can't find them. So I am sorry about that. Um, I know that all of y'all are new to campus, uh, and for those of you that are not new to campus, this 2019 was the last time we did in-person exams on a regular basis, um, so y'all are not used to this. Uh, this is normal for us. Um, we'll get you guys room assignments probably like Thursday of this week, maybe earlier. If it's earlier, good for us, um, but they're usually like the last thing we get done um, because photocopying, it's a thing. Uh, other things out of the chat. Uh, the next one is, will the time be provided during the exam? Will the time? Is that what the question was? Will it, yeah, will a timer be provided? Yes. Um, so what will happen is uh, in most of the rooms, um, we will have easy access to technology and we will be using the screens in that room and we will have a timer set up um, on those screens. It will be very large. Um, there is always a chance that there is something wrong with the technology. If that happens, what will happen is um, they will, we, we also give everybody things like whiteboard markers. Uh, I don't think we have that many chalkboards left, um, but they will then post the time uh, at regular intervals and you can always ask the proctors. Um, so there are going to be people in the room with you. I assume you thought about that um, and they will give you a time. Uh, the other thing is, if, if you have an old school watch, um, not an not an Apple watch, y'all. Uh, if you have an Apple watch, you will need to leave that at home because an Apple watch connects to the outside world. Uh, but if you have an old school watch um, that all it does is tell the time, you're welcome to have that. Um, but gotta gotta be old school. Your Apple watch that does connect to the outside world's not allowed. Um, but if you have a timepiece, that's the only thing it does. 
um, is, is tell time, you're allowed to have that. I don't know if y'all have ever owned one of those in your lives before, but you are allowed to have a watch, uh, assuming that it does not connect to the outside world. Other things out of the chat. I believe this this next one was touched on earlier, but uh, what will the periodic table that is given to us on the exam be labeled with? Uh, so if, to look at that, um, the periodic table, if you guys go to the 701 section um, and the 2019 exams, I think I, it's at the very, very bottom. I'll move it to the top so it's a little easier to see. Um, but you can take a look at the periodic table that we're going to give you on the exam uh, hanging out in a 2019 exam folder in the 701 section. Um, so aside from the fact that it's going to be in black and white, you can take your leisure and look at all the information that's on it. Um, because I understand that everybody would like to know, and no matter how many times I put it up on the screen, that will not answer all your questions. You can take a look at it on your own time because uh, it's in the 701 section. Other things right now. The uh, next one is, are the MC questions no calculator? Oh, no. Um, so I mentioned at the beginning that you should bring a calculator to the exam. Um, the multiple choice questions will have calculations required and they will just be randomized. Um, so that is a good question to ask. Um, so your entire exam, you get to have one of those three calculators for the entire exam. So the exam is not split into calculator and no calculator section, just the whole thing, you get the same resources. So no matter what part of the exam you're on, you get the same stuff. Periodic table, potentially useful information, pencils, a photo ID, calculators. Um, the other thing you actually can bring to the exam, by the way, um, are highlighters um, or, or other colored instruments um, that would mark the exam. Um, my main piece of advice is if you are going to bring a color, um, we print the exam on four colors of paper. Um, so bring at least two colors if you want to do this, uh, because every once in a while somebody brings a yellow highlighter and then their exam is printed on yellow paper and that highlighter is in use. Uh, so bring two colors if you would like to bring a highlighter, but you basically once the exam has begun, you're allowed to write on that exam however much you want. Um, so you are welcome to bring highlighters to that. Uh, but yes, the, the things you get, you get for the whole thing. Oh, uh, questions are randomized. I did also want to mention this. Um, so when I say that the questions are randomized, um, I mean they're randomized by a computer. They are not randomized with mindfulness. Um, so there are some questions that are calculation questions that will take longer than others and we do not mindfully choose where they go. Uh, so this is where part of your job is to figure out how to take the exam as best you can. Uh, so what I would recommend that you do when you take the exam is you basically go through and answer what, it, what are to you the easier the fast questions um, and skip the long ones. Because the thing with multiple choice is all of the multiple choice questions are worth the same number of points. So if question number one takes you 15 minutes and questions, what is it gonna be 25, 26, 27 and 28, all only took you 30 seconds, but you couldn't get to them because question one took you 15 minutes, then you've basically spent too much time on one question, not enough time on some of the other ones. Um, so my recommendation is to go through and answer things that to you are easy and fast. What to you is easy and fast may not be the same as for everybody. So whatever that means to you um, and skip the ones that are longer and make sure that you've got time to answer them because the beautiful thing with multiple choice is you can always just guess and then you've got a 20% chance of getting it right. Um, uh, but they are randomized so we don't organize those. 
other things out of the chat. All right, the next one is which chapters this is exam cover? Excellent. Kind of back to my stuff. Yay. Um, what is the exam cover? So for the record, this is in your syllabus. Uh, I did also have it on my plan to go over it. Uh, it's in the syllabus. Uh, so what is the exam cover? I need some space. Um, the exam covers, I'm going to go ahead and say it covers chapter one. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, chapter two, chapter three, and it covers part of chapter four, um, 4.1 to 4.5. Um, so a little, a couple of notes on this. Uh, so chapter one, really the only thing out of chapter one uh, are things like uh, your metric prefixes uh, and um, unit conversions, also sometimes called dimensional analysis. So this is really the only reason why we say chapter one uh, is because chapter one will cover things like how to go from centimeters to inches because on your potentially useful information, we actually have inches to centimeters. Um, so we can ask you to do conversions that involve what are called imperial units, like inches or feet or miles, uh, because on the potentially useful information page, we actually have those conversions hanging out. Um, so we can ask you to do those because we give you that information. Um, Chapter two, uh, this is where do pay attention to what we covered um, in class. Um, and then also the experiments, those are the ones that were not covered in class, but are still valid exam questions. Um, so there are also things that are in chapter two that we do not test on. Um, so we do not test on nuclear stability. And hopefully, Many of you are like, what do you mean nuclear stability? And the good news is you don't need to know, um, but it is something that is in the textbook. Uh, so somebody else had asked uh, before the review session, are we going to pull things out of the textbook that we didn't talk about in class? The only things are things we specifically said you are responsible for. There's a set of experiments that are in chapter two that we will hold you responsible for. Every professor has given some sort of stuff for that. Um, in my section, which I realize that everybody's got access to different things, uh, but in my section, that folder is labeled outside of class still on exams. Uh, I don't know what your instructor has labeled your folder. That's what mine says. Uh, outside of class still on exams. Uh, but those are the sections where that might come from. Uh, chapter three, this is pretty much all of it. Um, so chapter three is where we have stuff that has to do with light um, and some calculation stuff is in here. Um, and this is also where we talked about the Bohr model of the atom uh, versus the Schrodinger model of the atom, a uh, variety of things like that. Um, and quantum numbers are also in here. Quantum numbers. Uh, four, and then chapter 4.1 to 4.5, this is going to be um, parts of the periodic table. Parts of periodic table, um, as well as um, orbital notation, electronic configuration, and um, periodic trends. I'll tell you the same thing that I told uh, my SI. Um, one of the easiest ways to figure out where the material stops, um, one, one of the easiest ways to figure out if you have gone too far, um, on exam two, is where there will be ions. So believe it or not, on exam one, every single atom you will do, you will work with, is going to be a neutral atom. Will not have a charge. 
Um, so on exam one, we will do nothing but neutral atoms. On exam two, that will change. Um, but so if you're looking at various material and you're trying to figure out, have I gone too far? Exam one is only neutral atoms. Um, this is also not an exhaustive list. I was mostly just trying to name some things that kind of jog y'all's memories about what stuff was on there. Um, so these are the top, so these are the chapter components. So it's basically chapters one through a lot of chapter four, um, but 4.1 to 4.5. Gets us through parts of the periodic table, names of things like halogens, uh, noble gases, alkali metals, things like that, orbital notation, electron configuration, periodic trends. I'm going to see what I have left over here. Um, so on my list, we talked about where is the exam? We talked about when to show up. We talked about what the exam covers. Uh, we talked about what you will be given. Um, and that is also hanging out uh, in the 701 section. So you can take a look at the periodic table and potentially useful information. Uh, should I be familiar with the periodic table? I wanted to throw this question in here because this is kind of a really random piece of advice. Um, so here's the thing. On the exam, you will have the periodic table. It looks like this. We will occasionally ask you things like, um, I don't know, um, if we have an isotope of zirconium. Um, so let's say that we have things like zirconium 92. Um, and we want to know something about that, like how many neutrons does it have? How many neutrons? You have to find the element ZR on the periodic table. Now, you will have it in front of you. It will be a piece of paper. You will have access to it. There are 118 elements on the periodic table. If so, the more kind of sort of familiar you are with the periodic table, the faster you can find these. So this is one of those things where we will give you the periodic table. But I will tell you from experience, the folks that have had chemistry before and already know where carbon is and they already know where sodium is, they tend to be a little bit faster at exams because they know where some of the elements are. And when you know where some of the elements are, then when you hit one you've never seen before, you're like, well, that's either probably towards the bottom and it's probably in the middle or it might be hanging out in that block on the very bottom. Um, so that's a really weird piece of advice. But for those of you that have never seen a periodic table before and never worked with it, in your spare time, you might just look at it and be like, "Where? what is this element called P? Oh, it's phosphorus. All right, that's cool. Because um, the more comfortable you are with looking at it, oftentimes that's just helpful uh, on, on the exam in general. And... All right, we talked about, will we take questions out of the textbook that were not covered in class? Nope, uh, unless it was something we specifically said you are responsible for. Um, then some of the other topics I got asked a lot um, is how can I best prepare for the exam? Um, so I'm going to address this one and then I will also do another call out for the chat. I'm going to answer one more um, question. So as far as preparing for the exam, There are a variety of things to do. One, um, I'm going to assume that you're already doing Alex. So I'm not going to actually mention that one quite yet. Um, so I'm actually going to mention those end of chapter questions. Um, so the end of chapter questions will help you prepare for the exam. Uh, also, go through your notes. and summarize. We will ask y'all conceptual questions, 
So go through and try to figure out what's the big picture. If you were going to explain this to a friend, a roommate, a stuffed animal, I don't care, a rubber ducky, um, how would you explain some of these things? The nice thing is when you try to explain to another person, I understand that at some point you're going to hit something and you're going to be like, uh, um, especially when you start to think about like the Bohr model of the atom, because the Bohr model of the atom has some weird stuff in it. And you're like, now, wait a minute. Part of the Bohr model is correct and we still can use it. And part of the Bohr model is wrong. And where are those lines? See what you can come up with on your own. And when you get to the part where you don't know, that's the time then to go get help. Um, so as far as getting help goes, uh, we have SI, we have peer tutoring, we also have PLTL, but the registration for that is all closed. Um, we have office hours. Um, and we also, and you also have each other. So there are a variety of people that you can ask for help, and I do recommend that you'll talk to each other uh, about material. Um, the other thing I do recommend you do, even though I know we mentioned the fact that not all of the material is the same, um, I do recommend that you just sit down and just take the 2019 exam. I know that you'll see the sig fig questions and you can't do the sig fig questions because we never taught you sig figs. I know, um, but a lot of times trying to sit down and take that exam will help with things like timing. Like, can you actually answer all of those questions in 80 minutes? Because 80 minutes is what you will have. So can you actually answer all of those questions in that amount of time? Um, are there any that you're like, is that something we're supposed to be responsible for? Because uh, I know I had some of my students ask, like, I forgot what was on the 2019 exam, if it was like meters to miles or if it involved inches and centimeters, but it was something that was a different unit. And they were like, is that on the exam? And I was like, sure, you can absolutely do unit conversion things. Um, it helps give you um, how questions might be worded. Uh, and the other thing that I like about this exam um, is the questions are randomized. Uh, and that's not something that Alex does. Alex is not randomized. Alex has all of the topics in the heading. Uh, even the questions at the end of the chapters, not randomized. Um, they have got stuff where it'll tell you this is this is the chapter, this is the unit. You have to go by chapter by chapter, uh, but 2019 exam will be randomized. Um, so that's one of the advantages looking at questions and saying, okay, what am I supposed to do here? What is going on? Other things. Um, you can, um, if you're looking for extra practice, um, this is honestly part of why I mentioned the get help uh, is because most of those folks will also have extra practice for you. Um, if you didn't already know, uh, the SIs have um, an e-learning shell where they give you all their handouts. Uh, I can't show that to you because I'm not a student, so I can't actually see that, but those exist. <sighs> um, workshop stuff from various instructors um, and Alex can also help um, with, with extra practice. But a lot of your job is going to be trying to identify where do you need help with, what things are actually going on, um, and that is a skill. So when I say it's a skill, I mean it'll take some amount of trial and error to figure out the best way forward. Other questions from the chat? All right, I was going to pick up from what we had before, but one of uh, the next one I believe was how many questions are on the exam? Do, 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 do. I know I've been all over the place. Uh, how many questions are on the exam? It's here on my screen. Um, granted, I don't promise because the exams have not gone to the printers yet, but as of two o'clock this afternoon, we had 28 multiple choice and two short answer. It might change. But at two o'clock, that's what we had. Other questions? All right, the next one is, uh, when are exam results typically posted? 
when are exam results typically posted? So uh, I'm going to guess it's going to take us a week. I don't actually know because the short answer part, I don't know how long it's going to take us. Um, I'm guessing. Um, so because basically the scantrons still take us more than one day only because um, <laughs> this sounds silly, um, but it's true. Some people have problems bubbling in their name correctly. Uh, and so when you don't bubble in your name correctly, then it takes us longer to enter all of the grades. So that happens. Um, and then we actually have to physically grade everything and put everything together. So I'm going to go with a week because I, I do I do not know. Um, you should ask all the instructors and see what they say. We should we should take everyone's guesses because I, I don't I don't actually know. Um, we will do it as quickly as possible, I will say, just because um, just like you are going to be really eager to get your grade. Uh, all of us are very eager to have exam one done and over with. Um, and I don't mean that in like an uh, get us out of the way. I mean, everybody wants the results and part of your job as a student is to learn from your mistakes. And the longer it takes us to grade everything, the harder it is to remember what you did. Um, but I will actually say, because you're going to keep your exam paper, those multiple choice questions, you're going to leave with your multiple choice questions. So if you indicate on your paper what you selected on your Scantron, you can have your multiple choice results and you can do that yourself the next day because uh, we will post the keys um, to the multiple choice bef likely before we have your grades up. Um, it depends on what we decide to do as a team, but oftentimes you can talk to each other and figure out the right answers um, with that multiple choice section. But us getting you your grades, I'm going to go with a week. Other questions? All right, the next one is, what are the experiments that we have to know and will we have to know specific details about how those experiments worked or the are the general ideas and findings enough? So there are. I have to I have to write them down because I don't actually remember how many there are. Um, so you need to know. About Dalton, uh, which Dalton had postulates. Um, so and these a lot of times related back to things like um, conservation of mass. Um, they were things like um, compounds have fixed ratios of elements. So every single molecule of carbon dioxide has the same ratio of carbons and oxygens as every other molecule of carbon dioxide. Um, things like that. Then there is, I always forget how to spell this. I should know by now, you really think. Is there a P in that word or not? Uh, we won't test you on the spelling. <laughs> um, there's Thompson's cathode ray tube. I will come back and fill in details, but I have to get these out before I forget. Uh, Millikan, oil drop, uh, Rutherford's gold foil. And then I always put in there um, just because if you're going to do all of that, um, even though it's usually a single sentence. Um, just, that's how I spell the word neutron. Gosh, my spelling gets worse every single year. Um, neutron. There we go. Um, so that's kind of five. Um, Chadwick's not really an experiment. Um, so Thompson, Thompson's cathode ray tube is the one where essentially there is a beam of electrons. They didn't realize they were electrons. Um, so there's this tubey thing uh, and there is this beam that goes through it. And if you have a magnet here, um, if it is the negative side of the magnet, then this beam was repelled. 
Um, if it was the positive side of the magnet, then it was attracted. So you had a beam of stuff um, that was affected by the magnet. Beam affected by a magnet. Uh, and along with that, uh, basically figured out that there were electrons and that they were negative. Electrons were negative uh, and also got the um, mass to charge ratio. Uh, but not the mass nor the charge, just the mass to charge ratio. That's one. Millikan's oil drop. Millikan's oil drop is the one where there is a setup where there is, they call it an atomizer. Y'all, it's a fancy perfume bottle um, is, is what it was, uh, but usually they call it an atomizer. Uh, it's a fancy perfume bottle. Um, I understand that not everybody got to play with fancy perfume bottles as a child. Um, my apologies if your grandparents never had any of these to let you play with. Uh, but basically, this gets you a fine mist of oil drops. Uh, and then you do this weird thing where there's a little hole here and the oil drops start to fall. And then there's an X-ray source over here. And the X-ray source basically knocks electrons off of air particles and onto the oil droplets. And then, so what you wind up with is you wind up with oil drops that have electrons. That sounds really weird, I realize. If you've never thought about this before, if you do your own laundry and you take stuff out of the dryer and you get static electricity, that is because electrons have been knocked off of either like the air or have been knocked off of clothing and knocked onto other clothing. Um, so static electricity is basically the displacement of electrons onto other things. Uh, that's what static electricity is. So the X-ray detector is basically forcing static electricity to happen. Uh, and so because these oil drops have electrons, uh, what they actually then did is there's also these lovely plates at the top and the bottom. Uh, and you can basically run and get charges on these plates. So if you had a negatively charged plate here and a positively charged plate here, you could actually affect how fast these fell. Um, because and then what you would look at is you would look at the mass of the oil drop um as well as uh and how fast it fall, fell how fast it fell which you would know because of gravity uh, and you could basically then figure out if you know the mass of the oil drop which you know is nice and even because of the atomizer uh and then you can look at the difference uh in how fast the oil drops are falling uh, do the charge you place on those uh, plates, then you can actually solve for the charge of an electron um, because there were various numbers of electrons, but that then was affected in the oil drops by some sort of unit. Um, so the oil drop experiment gets you the charge on an electron. Charge on an electron. So not just that it's negative, but what the actual charge was. Uh, Rutherford's gold foil experiment. Uh, this is likely what folks, um, some folks know this one the best. I never know why. Um, but basically from these two experiments, what you wind up with is you wind up with what they call a plum pudding model of the atom. Um, and this plum pudding model was one that said, hey, uh, we know that there are atoms. Those definitely exist. And we know that there are electrons. And we're going to pretend that electrons are these like chocolate chips hanging out in this like diffuse positive stuff because we know that atoms do not have a charge that they are neutral so therefore there have to be positive stuff somewhere so electrons were things and then there was just diffuse positive stuff like cookie dough um and that was the plum pudding model rutherford's actual goal was to prove the plum pudding model. That was Rutherford's goal. But what Rutherford did is Rutherford took a really thin sheet of foil, uh, and this was gold foil, gold foil, uh, and then shot alpha particles through it. Um, alpha particles 
an alpha particle source. Alpha particles are essentially a helium nucleus. Um, so they are uh, two neutrons and two protons. So they're very small in comparison to a gold nucleus. And so the goal was to just shoot these particles through the foil. Uh, and then there was some sort of detector over here. And what happened, de come on, detector. Um, and what happened is most of your alpha particles went through. So most of the alpha particles are going straight through the gold foil, no problem, no problem. But every once in a while, one would get deflected. Um, and every once in a while, one actually would shoot back at the, at the source. Um, so every once in a while, that alpha particle would go back, uh, would go backwards. And that was really weird. And from that information, this experiment discovered the nucleus. Because essentially, all of that positive stuff was in one place. So from Rutherford, then, we knew that there was a nucleus and there were electrons, which we knew from Thompson uh, and Millikan. So, but Rutherford's the one that actually showed that the nucleus was this dense thing in the middle of an atom. Uh, and so that's what was having all those alpha particles bounce back. Now, they're, depending on how your textbook uh, is read, uh, a lot of times it will also say things like, Rutherford discovered the proton, which is true. Uh, that's actually a different experiment. So the gold foil experiment specifically discovered the nucleus. That's what the gold foil experiment did. Um, but Rutherford didn't just discover the nucleus and then be like, oh, I'm amazing. I guess I'm done now. Um, also, all of these experiments were teams of people, by the way. It was just Rutherford's lab that did it. There were other people that actually physically did the work. Um, but Rutherford's lab kept doing more experiments. So Rutherford did also discover protons um, later. But one of the things that they also knew once they had that information is that the nucleus was heavier than just all the protons, but they didn't know what else was in the nucleus. Uh, so Chadwick actually discovered the neutron. Um, and Chadwick discovered the neutron is usually all most Gen Kim textbooks say, uh, because since the neutron is a neutral particle, discovering the neutron was actually a really long game of what is not a neutron and what other things might it possibly be. Um, so Chadwick and the neutron is actually a much longer story that involves a process of elimination instead of a discovery of a particle. Um, so that's why we just kind of go with Chadwick and the neutron because it was a separate thing. It was a separate lab. It was a different person. Um, but that one's also actually very collaborative because Chadwick was communicating with lots of different people to be like, is this a thing you already know about? And they were like, no, that's not that's not what we have. Because um, uh, radioactivity was really big uh, at that time. Anyway, more information than you needed on that. But so those are your experiments. Uh, so you do need to know what they discovered, the general setup for what they that what they did. Um, and the way that these are phrased is typically how we describe them on exams. So we usually say things like Thompson's cathode ray tube experiment, Millikan's oil drop, Rutherford's gold foil. Uh, we don't test you directly on names, so we do not ask who used gold foil to discover something because this is not a history class. Um, but sometimes those names help people remember, so we usually add the names in if it helps, uh, but we don't test you directly on the names. Uh, but you should know what they did, roughly how their experiment worked, what they got out of it. I always think I'm going to get out of doing all of that, but I never do. Other questions out of the chat at this point? I believe the next one was uh, for computation problems. How accurate do the decimal points need to be? Uh, do we do we need to use sig figs for short terms, and will it be right or wrong or partial credit? Okay. Um, so as far as calculations go, this is one of the reasons why we have the potentially useful information. These values are the ones that we used to make all the questions. When it comes to a periodic table, 
whatever we give you on the exam is what we used to calculate that. So when you are doing your calculations, you should use the same numbers we used because that's going to help you with rounding errors. The other thing, so use the numbers we used. The numbers we give you on the exam are the numbers that we used. The other thing that will also help is whenever you're doing your calculations, my general rule of advice is to have however many numbers are in the problem. So same numbers from the problem plus two. And keep two more digits. Until the end. As far as your short answer questions go, we are currently working on the wording um, for those instructions. Um, so I do not know exactly how many we are going to ask for. Um, and I, I also don't know if we're going to ask for a particular type of notation, scientific notation um, or not. So the thing I'm going to tell you for the short answer uh, is to read the directions. Uh, so I do apologize that I do not know what those directions are right now, um, but we will have directions for you to tell you what you should be writing down, how much work you should show, um, how many digits to give us. Uh, so that will be in the directions of the short answer problem. So please read those directions um, because basically the, the team was starting to work on that language when I decided that I was going to stop reading my emails. Um, so I saw a rough draft, but we were not done yet. So excellent question. I'm unfortunately going to shove that one off till later. Other things. All right, the next one I believe uh, was on the card you showed earlier, but uh, do we have to memorize the speed of light? Uh, no. Avogadro's number or et cetera? Nope, potentially useful information. Other questions out of the chat. <laughs> All right, the next one is, can, uh, can you demonstrate a metric conversion so we, to make sure that we have the right idea of how such equations work? Da, 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 da. I get to do some math. Yay! <sighs> awesome. Okay. Um, so for kicks and giggles, uh, let's actually do something with more than just a metric conversion in it. Um, so let's say that we are given a wavelength of 12 millimeters. And the question is, I'm not writing this all out because it saves me a little bit of time. What's the frequency? Um, this is how I write the word, how I write the term frequency. Um, so let's say that that was the goal. So we have a wavelength. What is the frequency? So the first thing I'm going to want to think about, so from memory, oh no, what am I going to do? Um, there's an equation for this that does in fact involve the speed of light. So then I'm going to go to my potentially useful information because this thing is a constant. And I don't have to memorize constants. I can go to potentially useful information and find the speed of light. It's right there. They even still tell me that it's the letter C. How helpful is that? And the nice thing is these also have units. So I can use those units. So when I come back over here, I know that's 2.998 times 10 to the eighth meters per second and now I have a problem because the speed of light they gave me is in meters but the wavelength they gave me is in millimeters and I need my units here to match so in order to make those match what I'm going to go ahead and do and this is just my personal habit if you would like to change the units on the speed of light you can uh, it doesn't actually matter which way you go uh, it's just my personal habit to change whatever is not the constant. Um, and honestly, that's my personal habit because since I have the constants memorized, because after after you teach for a certain number of years, you just tend to do that. Um, if I'm not careful, I'll always 
put the same number in. So me changing the units of the constant will make me mess up. Maybe not you though. Um, so this 12 millimeters, I don't want this in millimeters, but what I know is I know that milli is essentially 10 to the negative three. So when it says milli is 10 to the negative three, what that means is you can do this in a couple of different ways. But what that means is for every one millimeter, that is one times 10 to the negative three meters. So when they're using metric prefixes, this is one way to do this. So in order to convert, uh, whatever is on the top here is what I'm going to put on the bottom. And then whatever the weird number is belongs to the base unit. Whatever the prefix is gets a one. So that's how I have them memorized. That's also how your textbook has them. So your textbook has whatever the weird number is belongs to the base unit. I'm going to show you one more way to do this before I get off of this. Um, so you can either have this then as 1.2 times 10 to the negative 2 meters, or you might have this as 0 0.012 meters. Either way. The other way to do this, uh, and not everybody likes this, but just in case. Um, so this is 12 millimeters. Milli is a prefix. So what I could actually do is I could say I am just going to replace milli with that prefix. That's all I'm going to do. So this then becomes 12 times 10 to the negative 3 meters. So wherever this m was, now I just put 10 to the negative 3. Um, and that will actually still get me 1. 0.2 times 10 to the negative 2 meters. Um, so they are prefixes, so you can use them as if they were translations. Some people really like that version. Some people really hate that version. You now have two options. The other thing I will tell you, everybody learns metric prefixes a little bit differently. I think I've seen at least like six different ways to teach metric prefixes. So if you do not like the two ways I have done it here, I highly encourage you to seek out the way you already know how. I don't know what that is because there's a lot of options, but if you don't like my way, you're welcome to pick a different way as long as you can do it because there are lots of different options. I limit myself to these two because Otherwise, I'd be here all night with metric prefixes. Um, so we have now converted. I have now scribbled over everything. So start my thing over again. Um, so I have a number for this now, 0 0.012 meters. Um, so now I can actually go ahead and solve. So I can go ahead and put in my speed of light, 2.998 times 10 to the 8 meters per second from the potentially useful information and then my wavelength, which I just calculated. Uh, which this is now also in meters uh, and then I'm going to solve for frequency. I did this ahead of time. Because I didn't want to have to calculate this on the fly. Because every time I calculate things on the fly, something goes wrong. Or not every time, but a lot. Because for those of you in my class, you've already experienced me talking and writing at the same time. Sometimes I make mistakes. Um, so this, that's a lot of extra digits. Let's go ahead and round that. Um, the nice thing is, is that for a multiple choice question, we will have options um, A through E. So just pick the one that matches. Um, so likely this would probably would have been 2.5 times 10 to the 10th. Um, and then realize that this could have been in uh, this second to the negative one. This also could have been in hertz because those are the same unit. So showed off one equation, showed off some metric conversions. There is one other thing. I wanted to mention that was from the stuff above, and this will let me talk a little bit about Alex and wait for some questions to come in the chat. 
Um, so somebody had asked me for my class, will all of the Alex topics be on the exam? Um, so Alex is valuable uh, as far as a resource. Um, the thing is, is, is that there are some things that you'll never see us do exactly on an exam. So for example, um, this one, deducing in an L from a subshell label, and it says complete the table below by filling in the principal quantum number in and angular momentum number L for each electron subshell listed. This is doable. Um, this actually could be like a short answer question on the back of the exam, actually. We could do that. Um, but this is not set up in a multiple choice format. The other thing with this is, we would probably do this differently um, for a short answer just because um, this essentially asks you to do like four times the exact same thing. Um, and we don't typically ask you to do that much repetition. Um, so this concept from Alex, valuable. Being able to say, okay, if I have five F, this five right here is in fact my value of N, this F right here should relate to my value of L. Uh, and since it is the F subshell, S, P, D, F, 0, 1, 2, 3, um, I should know that 5 is just my value of N and that F gives me an L value of 3. Um, but we can use that in lots of different ways on the exam. So the odds of us actually asking you to fill in this table, low. The odds that we want you to be able to do this skill, very high. Um, so this skill, valuable. The exact way that this is phrased, eh, not so much. Um, but the skill, valuable. Uh, compared to this Alex question, where it says a chemist weighs out 4.69 grams of calcium, calculate the number of moles she weighed out. Um, there's only so many ways to ask y'all how to go from grams to moles. And we'll ask you to go from grams to moles. Um, so this question, quite valid. Um, it might even look exactly like this because there, there's not that many ways to ask you about grams to moles conversions. Um, there, there just are not. Um, I will go ahead and do this one. So here's my number of grams of calcium. I now need to find calcium on the periodic table. Here is calcium on the periodic table. This is again, I'm, I know that you guys can't see, but I'm going to use this teeny tiny little number way down here, um, 40.08 grams. In one mole. Um, so this is always the tricky part with Alex is that there are some things in Alex that are straightforward and we will probably sound a heck of a lot like it on the exam. There are other questions though that we have to rephrase. Um, and I did just kind of cherry pick to give you guys two examples, but that at least gets hopefully a point across um, that some of them work really well, but not all of them do. Um, so Alex is useful, but will not be the same. Now that I got to take, do some questions, questions from the chat. Sorry about that. Um, okay. uh, you just got this one before I, in that conversation was will all Alex questions be on the test? But the next one, uh, Alex, you just want a quick, quick snap on that one. Because I remember you did just mention that. But the next yep. one is, um, what if uh, what is what if we have accommodations like extra time or we have it placed or half ah, sorry about that have to take the exam at the testing center? How does that work? Okay, um, so um, we are not using the testing center. Um, so if you have accommodations, uh, accommodations, um, what's going to happen um, is we will have a separate room. Um, I don't have any room assignments right now, so I also don't have your room assignments. Um, and you're going to get an email from us with instructions. Because uh, basically what we do is um, we basically put all of the OSA students, although there's got a different name for the office now, and I forgot what the new name is. Um, 
but we just put everybody in the same room because that way we cover all of the accommodations at once. Um, also, we have a limited number of people to help us, um, but we do not use the testing center for a variety of reasons that I am happy to talk about one on one. Um, but we don't we don't use a testing center. Um, so we'll be in a separate room. Um, the the other thing is, is that if you are worried, um, I I Dr. Taylor, me, uh, I am actually one of the best people to talk to um, because yes, you can also reach out to your personal instructor. Um, but unless somebody takes the responsibility away from me, which usually nobody wants extra work, um, I am actually the one that is going to have the master list of everybody and what all is required for all of that. Um, so the nice thing is, is that that office has so far um, been emailing the 701 section. So I have what I hope is a master list. I'm going to be checking with all the other instructors, um, but again, unless someone takes it away from me, I am actually the master of that list. Uh, Dr. Diekman is the one who was supposed to get us a room, uh, which is why I don't know what the room is. Um, so valid question, and there will be an email with instru instructions, because um, one of the things that I need to verify uh, is when we are starting, because I believe we actually usually start early um for extra time but i'm going to put a question mark on that because i need to double check with dr diekman but we usually start y'all earlier um and that is mostly because usually on saturdays people have conflicts the later saturday goes um so so typically the later we are on saturday the more people start to say oh but i have oh but i have uh, so we usually start those accommodations earlier um, so that that way everybody's done by 1130 is usually what the goal is. But I need to double check that. Other questions out of the chat? All right, the next one is um, what equations do we need? So what equations do you need? Fabulous. Um, so This is one of the reasons why I put this calculating and using the molar mass of elements as one of the questions I wanted to talk about, because I don't know what equation you think that is, because that is a conversion. That is a skill of being able to use the periodic table and knowing when you need Avogadro's number and when you don't. I don't know what that counts as. So this is a valid question on the exam. I don't know if you think that this is not an equation because it's a conversion, or if you've got an equation to go from grams to moles and you already know how to go backwards, or if you think this is two equations, one to go from grams to moles and one to go backwards from moles to grams. So I don't know how to deal with this as an equation, but you need it. So there's this one. Then, uh, so there's so there's this problem <laughs> with the calculating molar mass of elements also dealing with Avogadro's number. I, I don't know what you think that is. Then we just did this one, uh, which was also looking at wavelength and frequency. So we, so as far as definitely an equation goes, we did wavelength and frequency. There is also another one that does energy, uh, Planck's constant, and frequency. Then, I'm sorry my class, you guys have already heard this spiel before. Some people will actually go ahead and have these rearranged. So this is rearranging this one and then plugging in energy is equal to Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by wavelength, or energy is equal to Planck's constant times C divided by wavelength. Um, so some people will go ahead and say that this is another equation that they will have memorized. Um, you can just use both of those. Uh, you will get exactly the same answer. They work just fine. Uh, but some people like to go ahead and have memorized an additional equation so if they need to move between wavelength and energy, they know how. So that's an option. 
Um, so again, we have another problem where I think that there's only two equations, one, two, um, but some people might say that there's three. Um, other people might go ahead and be like, but I see five. Um, valid point. So, th so th this is the reason that I do not know how many questions, how many equations are on the exam. That being said, I'm going to write down one more uh, because I do like to kind of answer this question, even though I don't actually know how many you think there are. Uh, I'm going to write down one more. Uh, I will also tell you that change is equal to final minus initial. And I will tell you that energy is equal to negative B divided by N squared. This is the Bohr equation. Uh, and so therefore, if you have a change in energy, this is equal to, I'm going to do it the way I did it in class, negative B divided by N squared final minus negative B divided by N squared initial. The way that I clean this up looks like this. Um, change in energy is equal to B negative 1 over N squared final plus 1 over N squared initial. Um, there are different flavors of this equation depending on how much you want it to look prettier and what you mean by prettier. That's what I do. That's not what you have to do. I mean, this will work when I say what you have to do. Um, this this works. Um, this is this is what I did when I was working on the exam this morning. I used this one. Um, but other people will use other flavors. Um, so sometimes they don't like the negative sign, and so they take out the negative sign, which changes things, or sometimes they'll rearrange terms because for some reason having minus, ne having negative one over n squared also annoys people. So just like flip those terms. Anyway, many algebra things could be done, um, but that's that's what my set looks like. That's that's what I do. Um, so I don't, it's, oh, and there's one other, there's one other calculation. I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget. Oh, I'm so excited. Um, Cause there's one more mathy thing we can do to you. Um, which is the one where we ask you to do the uh, average atomic mass. Uh, and so that's the one where if we say, hey, here's uh, an isotope um, that has a particular mass of 20.998, and another isotope. Um, why is it on that side? Da, 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 da. Um, 21. Um, and another isotope that's at like 19.888. Uh, and we ask, what is the average atomic mass? I, I don't know if you think this is a formula or not. Um, but now I made a problem, so now we have to do it. Also, if we do this one, we have to do the other flavor of this question too. Da -da 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 -da. Oh, uh, any abundance. I'm not done yet. Sorry, I prepared to do the other version of this question. Um, what do I want? What do I want? Um, let's make this 99, 9, 9, 92%, and we'll therefore make this 8%. Um, so, um, so what is the average atomic mass given this information about isotopes? These would be in AMUs. By the way, this is the reason why I like to point out the fact that we post old exams because there should probably be more words to describe this question, but I decided to do this. So I'm going to take my percentage and turn that into a decimal. and take that percentage and turn that into a decimal. And that's going to be my calculation. And yes, I will do the other flavor of this um, because that is usually the next thing that comes up in the chat. 
Um, and that one I actually did do ahead of time because um, that's the one that I, I get more nervous about if I try to do that one on the fly. This one I'm not so worried about. This, this one's relatively, in comparison, is somewhat straightforward. Uh, the other one requires me to do more algebra. Um, so the other one makes me nervous to do on the fly. Um, uh, da -da -da. And then this is the time where I would be looking how, how many numbers do they think I need? How many numbers am I supposed to report? Um, just figure out how much rounding I might need to do. Hold on. Okay, good. Um, Sorry, my OneNote occasionally gets mad at me. Um, because I don't think Macs and Microsoft products are good friends. So, one. Da, 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 da. Um, so, occasionally OneNote does weird stuff. Otherwise, OneNote's fantastic. Um, so, yeah, so I don't know quite how much we went around this, so I'm going to leave it like that. Um, but we could round it if the answer required. So there's one version. Um, and then the reason why I wanted to bring up the other one again is on this idea of I don't know how to call this an equation. Because the other version of this, so this one, they give you both isotopes, they give you the abundance. The other, and then you solve for the average atomic mass. The other flavor of this question is to say, here is, I need different letters. Uh, I guess we'll use Y and Z. Um, so we'll say the isotope Y has an average atomic mass. I did not give myself that many decimal places when I was preparing. Uh, and Z has isotope Z, we'll go with this being 26 and this being 25. Um, 24.99, and then they actually tell you that the average atomic mass is this, 25.25 AMUs. And then the question is, uh, what is the percent abundance? Of Y26. Um, so this is the one where, with this question, you can only do this with two. So I'm not, so here I'm not using two just to make my life easier. I'm only using two because that's the only way you can do this problem um, unless we give you more information uh, because you essentially have to be able to assume that Y26 plus Z25 is equal to 100%. Um, that's the only way that this works, uh, is, is that those two things added together is equal to 100. Otherwise, we can't go anywhere. Um, so since we can assume that, what I can then do is, uh, unfortunately, hold on. I'm going to get out of one note because it's doing that thing again. I hate when it does that. Um, but since we can assume that both of those are equal to 100% when you add them together, what we are then going to be able to do is, I usually like to go ahead and pretend that one of these is X and one of these is Y. I use Y and Z, so we're just going to go with Y plus Z is equal to 100%. And now we're not going to use percentages, right, before we use decimals. So I'm actually just going to say that y plus z, instead of being equal to 100%, is just equal to 1, because that would be 100% as written as a decimal. And now I can go ahead and solve one in terms of the other. Uh, in this case, since I want to know about the abundance of y, uh, I'm going to keep y. I'm going to solve for z, which is 1 minus y then. Uh, so then when it comes to the equation, Originally, if we were just doing this all with what I'm looking for, I would have something like y times my 25.99 
plus Z times the other number I gave, 24.99, is equal to my average atomic mass, 25.25. But I now know one in terms of the other. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to then put this right there. So this is still going to be, I'm just going to rearrange this a little bit, 25.99 times y plus 1 minus y times 24.99. So now I have one equation with one variable. Um, so now this works out a lot better. Uh, 1 times 24.99 is 24.99. Negative y times 24.99 is negative 24.99 times y is equal to 25.25. I need to get rid of that cursive because someone's going to ask me why my y's look different because they will be confused. Except now my eraser doesn't work. Come on, we've done so well together. Erase. There we go. Y, 25. Um, I'm going to combine like terms. Um, so 25.99 minus 24.99 happens to just be 1. So 1 times y uh, is equal to 25.25 minus 24.99, um, which is 0 0.26. Uh, y is equal to 0 0.26. Um, or now doing this in terms of abundance, the thing we were looking for which is y26 is equal to 26%. So this is just again to illustrate the fact that we didn't necessarily have an equation for this, but we expect y'all to be able to do it. So again, this is another one of those cases where this is calculating a weighted average is what this is called. Um, and it is something we expect you all to be able to do on the exam, both the forward version that I did first, where we gave you percent abundances and we gave you atomic masses and asked you to calculate the average, and this other version where the missing information is the percent abundances and you have to solve for it. So you should be able to do both of these, and I don't particularly know where the equation is. Um, so, or especially how to do the second one, because that one takes a little bit more effort. Uh, but both of them are valid, both of them are valid calculations. Uh, but as far as calculations on the exam go, uh, I don't know how to classify those as calculation questions, or as far as equations go. Um, so you can, by the way, you can always, always, always ask me how many equations are on the exam because if you'll notice, while I didn't give you a numerical answer, I did try to answer the question. Um, so I, I can't tell you like, oh, there's five, um, but I can walk you through what sorts of calculations might you do. Um, so you can always, always ask me how many equations are on the exam just realize that this is how I answer that question. Um, so I will answer it. I just, it's not a short answer ever, ever. Questions from the chat? All right, I believe, um, I believe where we left off the next one was, are we allowed to use scratch paper or are we only allowed to use the space on the pa exam paper? You are allowed to use scratch paper. Um, so what will happen um, is, we will begin the exam and I'm trying to remember if there is, I think there's automatically one piece of scratch paper on your exam. Um, so I've got a whole bunch of blank pieces of paper in front of me. Um, so essentially when you get your exam, it'll have like, it'll have instructions on the front and a place to put your name and all your instructions and stuff. Uh, you can look at the 2019 exam to figure out what the front page looks like. Um, and then on the very on the very back, um, it'll be staples. Uh, and on the very back will be potentially useful information, periodic table, and a, and, and one piece of scratch paper. 
there's always a piece of scratch paper at the back. Um, so what you can actually do once we say go, so once, once your time has begun, you can actually go ahead and rip those pieces off so that you have an exam booklet and you have um, the potentially useful information in your one piece of scratch paper over here. Um, and this is all gonna be yours to take home. The Scantron is the only thing we're gonna want. Um, so you can, you can do whatever you want with all of this. So you'll start with your one piece of scratch paper um, and you can always ask for more. Uh, all the proctors, we do have extra scratch paper, but we ask that you start with what you have. Um, so start with what you have, and most folks, once you get to like the first couple questions, you can kind of figure out how much scratch paper you might need. Um, so you can always ask for it early, um, but we won't give it to you until the exam begins. Um, and that honestly is mostly because we don't give every room like a whole ream of paper. We give every room like a hundred sheets of paper which is more than enough. It is more than enough scratch paper, uh, but some people will take like 50 sheets of scratch paper to be like, I need scratch paper. You don't, you'll be fine. Um, so every exam has one piece of scratch paper with it. Uh, you are welcome to ask for more. There is plenty more, but the proctors won't give it to you until the exam begins because we would like you to at least see what you have to work with before you demand a ream of paper for yourself. Um, but we have paper, we have lots of paper. We have lots of it. Other questions from the chat? Sorry about that. Um, the next one looks like, um, can we bring water with us or, or are we allowed to use the restroom? So you are allowed to bring water. Um, so some things that I usually tell my room, um, if it's on your desk, I get to touch it. The proctors get to touch it. Um, so if that's a problem for you, then don't bring it. Um, so I mentioned highlighters before. Uh, people will bring extra erasers. Um, people may bring extra calculators. You can bring lots of stuff, uh, but just realize if you bring it and it's on the table, I get to touch it. I get to pick it up. I get to investigate it. Um, for any other problems like this. Uh, as far as the restroom goes, just keep in mind you have 80 minutes um, to take the exam. And we do not pause that for restroom breaks. So if you have to go, you got to go. All right, I get it. Um, but just, just realize that that 80 minutes includes any restroom breaks you might possibly take. Uh, and we will make you go to the bathroom one at a time like you were in kindergarten. Um, and I know it sometimes is a little bit weird. I usually will tell the proctors to escort you out to the hallway. That is honestly, I know it sounds weird. That's because I don't think you know where the bathroom is, <laughs> okay? Um, this is especially because I used to proctor a room in green. Um, and if I didn't have somebody follow the person out to the hallway, the person got lost. Um, and didn't know where the bathroom was. Um, so I usually instruct the proctors to escort the student to the bathroom because especially in Green and Johnson, sometimes y'all get lost um, and that scares me. Uh, so I know that's a little bit weird, but that's usually what it is. But just, just realize that we do not pause. Um, if you take 15 minutes in the bathroom because you gotta go, then you lose that time on the exam. Other questions? I believe this one was touched on the beginning of the meeting, but uh, do we need to use pens for short answer uh, short answer responses? We don't care. On, uh, personally, I would prefer you use pencil just because you have to use pencil for the Scantron to actually be able to be read. And so, and if you need to erase something, erasing in pencil is way easier. So I'd, I'd recommend pencil. Um, if you personally prefer the other then for your short answer, I still recommend pencil <laughs> because you you only you only have the back of the scantron to write on. Um, so you're you're only going to have about an eight and a half by eleven piece of paper to write your short answer on. Um, it should be plenty. It should be enough. Um, but that's all you got. Other questions out of the chat. I believe the next one is: uh, Will partial credit be given on this exam? Yes. 
so that is what the short answer questions are for. Um, so short answers will be given partial credit. Um, short answers will have partial credit. Um, multiple choice do not. Multiple choice, there is no partial credit. So multiple choice questions are either right or they are wrong. Other things? The next one is, uh, how much will the short answers be worth percent wise? I don't know. Don't know. Excellent I question, I don't know. Okay. Other things? <laughs> All right, the, uh, the next part was, do we need to memorize six points of atomic theory? So that is in Dalton's postulates. So that's where atomic theory is. Atomic theory is in Dalton's postulates. Yes, you are responsible for Dalton's postulates. Okay. The next one is, do we need to know in detail? Oh, wait, where'd that one go? Oh, there, oh, wait. I just lost that question. Where'd that go? Um, it happens. No worries. Okay. Uh, well, no, this one I was are we responsible for, and how do we find valence electrons for transition metals? Oh, fabulous! Um, da -da 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 -da. I'm up here at the table. So, so in general. Uh, when you are looking for valence electrons, um, so I know the person asked about uh, transition metals. I will address that, um, but first, um, in general, when you're looking for valence electrons, the easiest way to do that for most um, of your elements is take a look at these little numbers that are hanging out uh, that say 1a, 2a, 3a, 4a, 5a. Um, these are the number of valence electrons for the most part. Um, helium would be the exception in here because uh, this 8A applies down here. Uh, helium is different um, because your valence electrons are your outermost electrons. Um, so if you wanted to know the number of valence electrons of carbon, that's four because it says 4A, so it's four valence electrons for carbon and silicon and germanium and tin and lead and even this one down at the bottom, fluorobium. Um, the question that was asked was about the transition metals. So there is a longer definition of valence electrons that also works really well. Um, the tricky part is, is that we have not actually talked about electron configuration, so we're just gonna have to assume that you know what that is. Uh, and I'm gonna do the electron configuration for, let's do, uh, let's do, uh, sorry. <laughs> Manganese, we're gonna do manganese. Um, so I realize uh, that you may or may not have seen this before. Uh, so therefore I'm gonna do this the long way. Um, so when doing electron configuration, there are blocks of the periodic table. Um, so this is called the S block. The middle block is D. This block over here is called the P block. Uh, and down here is F. And here in the middle is D. Um, so you can kind of see these little blocks every time the landscape of the periodic table changes, you're changing blocks. Um, P is up here. Helium's weird. Um, so in order to do this electron configuration, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to stir at the top one. Um, and this is at the S block. And so in order to give me the two blocks that are in the S block, because helium's the other one, I'm going to put a two here. This is for the number of electrons that would belong there. Then I'm going to come down here to the next row, and I also have two, and because I'm in this block, I have S, and then two, one, two. Then I go over to P. I'm still in the second row, and there's one, two, three, four, five, six. So two P6 is next. Next row, three, I'm back to S, two, Notice I'm skipping D for right now, but I'm on the 3P. And there's also six there. And then I hit the next row, and that's four. And now I wish I had done this a little bit higher. Um, four, 
S in two. And then I finally get the D block. This is actually 3D. We can talk about why in a moment. And then I'm going to manganese. And so that is one, two, three, four, five. 3D, five. So what this should actually give me is this should give me all of the electrons and where they are in one neutral ground state atom of manganese. Um, so you also heard me say the words neutral and ground state. Because we can also have excited states, but if you are producing it, and usually you will see the phrase neutral ground state atom of manganese. So the question was for valence electrons. So if I am looking for valence electrons, what I'm actually looking for is I'm actually looking for the highest value of N. So it turns out when we look at electron configuration, all of these numbers, one, two, two, three, three, four, three, all of those numbers are values of N. So if I want to know the number of valence electrons, all I have to do is find the highest value of N and count all of the electrons that are in there. My highest value of N is four. The only electrons that wound up in the four shell are the two that are in the S subshell. So therefore manganese, and it turns out all of the D block elements only have two. Actually, not all of them, most of them, most, most, most. I can show you the exceptions too. Um, most of the D block elements have two valence electrons. Um, so it's the highest value of N, and those are the valence electrons. Um, quickly to show you that this does actually work for all of them, if I was to do, say, carbon, which yeah, I'm going to cheat and do something that's way higher up. Um, so if I'm doing carbon, 1s2, 2s2, 2p2 for carbon, I'm again looking for the highest value of n. My highest value of n now is 2, but since I care about the highest value of n, I care about all of the electrons that are in the highest value of n. And I have two in the S subshell, and I have got two in the P subshell. Two plus two is four. These twos, I should not have picked carbon. Um, so the number of electrons out of the subshells added together give you the valence electrons. Uh, and that does match that 4A that we saw in carbon before. So valence electrons are based on the highest value of N is where that comes from. The other thing I'm, so for those of you that are like, whoa, I've never seen this before, this is the beginning of chapter four. So electron configuration is the very beginning of chapter four. That's where this is. Um, so I mentioned the fact that not all of the D block elements have two valence electrons. Some of them are different. So there are going to be five exceptions um, that will not quite do what you think they will do. Um, they are chromium, molybdenum, copper, silver, and gold. Um, so these five are actually exceptions and they do this kind of weird thing um, where what happens, also you notice me not making pink this W down here, that's because tungsten doesn't do this, um, but chromium, molybdenum, copper, silver, and gold all do, um, which is, so we just did this whole long thing out for manganese, um, and all I'm going to do is I'm going to look specifically at just this last part, so the 4s2 and the 3d. So for chromium, this would have been 4s, um, and I'm actually going to go ahead and draw and do the orbital notation instead, so chromium would have been 4s, and we would have done 2, and then we would have been 3d, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, the thing, though, is, is that a half-full d subshell is really super stable. 
So when we actually do chromium, it actually looks like this uh, and you actually get, um, so we would actually do the noble gas and you would actually call this 4S13D5. And it looks like this instead. Um, this is because a half full D subshell is very stable. And so the extra stability of having five uh, electrons in the 3D um, orbitals is more stable than having the two in that 4S. Uh, so that one electron is actually in the 3D subshell. This is one of those cases where this is what we see experimentally, uh, and this is energetically more favorable. So this is one of those times where we're going to have you memorize exceptions because this is actually what we see in nature. Um, so there are five exceptions to the electron configuration. Um, so then in this case, again, when we're talking about valence electrons, chromium technically then only has one valence electron because there's only one electron in the 4S subshell. So that's, that is. Um, are there any other questions out of the chat that I can answer? Because we're at six o'clock. So if there's questions out of the chat that I can answer, I'll do my best to do those quickly. All right, there still are a few more. Uh, the next okay. one is, how many points are taken off per question missed? Um, that one relates, unfortunately, right back to how many questions, how many, what percentage points are the short answer worth? And I don't know. Um, so valid question, excellent question. Please ask your instructors this week. Hopefully we'll have that information. Maybe it's hanging out in my email right now. I don't know. Um, but I do, I do not have that information, so I cannot share it at this point. Great question. I don't know. Other questions? The next one is, where do we find the SI session information on e-learning? Um, so I just copy this over too. Um, so there's two different places for SI session information to be, first of all. Um, one is over here on the left hand side where it says organizations. Organizations is where your SI folder, your SI shell would be. You will not see it on my page because I am not a student enrolled in the class. So they, they don't give faculty access to that. So you are going to have to go to your e-learning and your current organization and click on stuff because I cannot show you where that is. It doesn't show up for me. The other thing, if you would like to know where the SI sessions are or any information with that, um, I do just, took a screenshot of it, um, but if you go to the Student Success Center website on the UT Dallas homepage, this is also where you will find all of the information about all of the campus resources. Uh, so I would highly encourage you to take a look at these websites because this is also where the most up-to-date information is going to be. Also, maybe SI is offered for one of your other classes that you are interested in um, because they just have everything listed alphabetically by um, course prefix. So our information is hanging out, but you can also get to that by going to the Student Success Center website, which I always get to by searching for Student Success Center from the UT Dallas homepage. Other questions? All right, the next one is, if our professor did not provide information on material that was covered, was not covered in class, but we on exams, is there somewhere else we can find it? So, all of the instructors agreed on what information we were going to cover in class and what information we were not going to cover in class, but people were responsible for. So, first thing I would actually do is check all of your folders in e-learning. Um, I know for my students, I love you guys, you're wonderful, um, but I know for my students because I went ahead and put a giant Google calendar on top of my course homepage, I know that some of my students sometimes forget to scroll down. So if you have not scrolled down and clicked on everything in your course homepage, uh, then you need to do that. Um, otherwise, First, talk to your instructor. Uh, if you are looking for more resources, you can always talk to other instructors. But the first thing I would start with is ask your instructor and don't forget to scroll down. Uh, because also the other reason why I say don't forget to scroll down 
is because sometimes on mobile devices, e-learning does not present as well as it should. Um, so that is not just a like you didn't scroll. That's also because sometimes if you're on a mobile device or on a tablet, um, sometimes things are not as clear as they would be otherwise. Uh, case in point, this left hand menu. Um, if you are on a tablet, this left hand menu is usually missing and your course homepage looks like this. And so if your instructor is using that left hand menu, uh, you might be missing stuff as well. So excellent question. That's my best instructions. Other questions out of the chat. Right. The next one is, will doing just the assigned end of chapter questions listed on e-learning be enough to prepare for the exam or do you suggest doing unassigned questions as well? So as far as doing unassigned questions, this is where if you have the time, I would recommend doing more problems because one of the things that I will never know, and this is mostly because every person is different, is you have 80 minutes to take the exam. Eight zero minutes. For some people, that is plenty of time. For other people, that is not plenty of time. And the more questions you practice, the better you are at identifying what is the question asking me to do and how do I solve it? Because that idea of what is this question actually asking for? Which equation do I need? Which information do I need? Do I need a constant? Is this a dimensional analysis question? What's happening here? All of that information, that's a skill in and of itself. And the more you can practice that skill, the better prepared you will be. Um, again, I, I don't have a, I've never been able to figure out how to know if somebody will have 20 extra minutes and how to know if somebody is gonna have like two extra minutes. I, if I knew I would tell you, uh, but I don't. Other questions? The, uh, the next one is, do we need to know the law of definite proportions, law of multiple proportions, and the law of conservation of mass? Those are all part of Dalton's postulates, so yes. All right. The next one is, well, we need to remember where the alkali metals, metalloids, met metals, and things of yeah, things of that nature are on the periodic table, or where yes. they are on the periodic table. Yes. Um, so, where was that? Um, <laughs> when we talked about what the exam covers, and I said parts of the periodic table, that was what I was referring to. Uh, so I do, I know that parts of periodic table doesn't necessarily mean much to everybody, um, but it is supposed to mean metals, non-metals, metalloids, as well as alkali, alkali metals. Uh, we'll do noble gases, halogens, and chalcogens. So we'll do tra and transition metals and lanthanides and actinides series. Um, do notice, even though I have scribbled all over it, um, that again, aside from the fact that it's in black and white, this is your periodic table. The lanthanides and actinides are labeled. Um, and that information will still be there. So yes, you will need to know things of that nature. Do take a look at the periodic table that you will be given. It's the same one as is in your textbook. It's just in black and white, and it's hanging out in the 2019 exam folder in the 701 section. Other things. Right, the next one is when doing any kind of conversion, do we always keep the one on the bottom? So what I assume you mean by you always keep the one on the bottom. Um, so where is the one I was doing? Um, so I actually didn't draw it here, um, but I assume you mean by the one on the bottom. I assume you mean we did a conversion. Usually you take whatever you were given in the problem um, and you just start with that and put it over one. Um, I assume that's what the person in the chat means. Um, this is a fairly standard way of doing conversions and it's a mathematical truth that you can take any number and divide it by one and you still just get itself. So I'm going to tentatively say yes. The only thing that I'm worried about is if you were starting with a ratio. Um, so what I mean by that is if you were starting with something like um, meters per second, uh, right? So uh, I don't know, 
12. Um, so if I was trying to talk about 11 meters per second, um, this is a ratio. So this is technically 11 meters per one second. So you still have the one, the one is still there, um, but notice that my seconds then also went in the bottom part of that fraction because that's where that unit belongs. Um, so that's the only thing I would be cautious about. Also, gosh, I wish I could see what you meant on paper. Um, so I'm gonna hope that I answered your question. If I did not, um, I have office hours tomorrow, both an in-person one and an online one. Um, so if I didn't answer your question with that, then we probably need to get face to face and look at a piece of paper together. Other questions from the chat? The next one is, do we need to memorize wave spectrum chart? Do you need to memorize the wave spectrum chart? Um, no, um, because we will give you whatever wavelengths you might possibly need. Um, you, again, that's where your metric prefixes will come in handy. Um, so you don't necessarily need to know what the range of a microwave radiation is or the range of um, visible light is, but that's where your metric conversions will come in handy. Um, same game, you'll need to know what, a line, what line spectra are from uh, atomic line spectra, but you don't need to memorize any of those, but you need to be familiar with what they are um, and how we get those. Other things. This next one, it says, this question is more related to chapter three. What does it mean when we say in one electron system, subshells have the same energy? Oh, um, so really, this is, yeah, um, sorry, I'm looking at the time. I'm like, can I do this quickly? Um, so a one electron system. Um, so essentially, this is a way to try to talk about Bohr versus Schrodinger and why we need um, the other the other equation. Um, so essentially, the Bohr model talks about dealing with values of n, um, and the Bohr model talks about how to deal with transitions in between values of n, and that's all it does. And this works for a one electron system, um, which means it works for hydrogen. So the thing is, is that then when we go beyond hydrogen, is that's when we start to get things like n equals one and l equals zero, uh, and we have a subshell there, and we have n equals two, and then we have an L equals zero and we have an L equals one. And so now our N equals two isn't one energy level. Our N equals two actually has two energy levels. One for S, uh, one for 2S and one for 2P. Um, so when we talk about a multi electron system, we wind up with multiple energy levels and that every subshell actually has its own energy level. So in a multi-electron system, we are dealing with 1s and 2s and 2p, and all three of those have different energy levels. This is the reason why the Bohr model fails, um, because Bohr doesn't have subshells. Uh, so Bohr fails because there are no subshells in a Bohr model. But the reason why it works uh, for a one electron system is because if we were doing, oh no, one note, um, follow the blue stuff. Uh, if we were doing a one electron system, you have an N equals one, an L equals zero, and that's one energy level. And if you have N equals two, uh, and you have an L equals zero and an L equals one, those are actually on the exact same energy. Um, so your 2s and your 2p are on the exact same energy in a one electron system. Um, so that's what it's trying to tell you. And that whole system is trying to describe, especially the Bohr model. Um, and it's just trying to back up the fact that Bohr's model works for hydrogen. Bohr's model fails once you have more than one electron. So that's what that's trying to relate back to. Um, because Bohr's model works, but only in a really specific case. Anything else out of the chat that I can answer quickly? Uh, the next one is, when do you need, uh, 
Avogadro's number, when converting, and when do you not? Okay. Um, so it's six. It's six fifteen. So that we're finally starting to get into ones where, in order to show off, I would basically have to do calculations. Um, I can try to answer that one short. The short answer for that is when you have atoms. The short version is if you have atoms or you need atoms, that's when you need that. Um, but likely when people ask me that question, they actually want to see a calculation. Um, so we are probably at the point where unless there are procedural questions left, what you likely need to do at this point is send me the rest of the questions and I can make a separate video and share that with y'all. Um, but we are probably to the point where in order to answer any more questions well, I probably need to do example calculations is my best guess. Unless you can find other procedural questions. All right, the, I think the last one for that would be, is there any extra credit for this test? No, this course does not have extra credit. Um, so there is no extra credit for the test. There is no extra credit for the class. There is no extra credit for Alex. No. We don't do extra credit. Right. And I believe and that's with the short ones. Oh, sorry. And, and with that, that kind of wraps up Gen Chem study session. I will send you um, all the remaining questions, Dr. Taylor, so you can Excellent. do that video as described. Fabulous. And I will get to work on the video. So hopefully we can share it out with your students soon. Fantastic. Sweet. Sounds great. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, Dr. Taylor, for your time. We'll see you next time at Gen Chem Study Session. Adios.